Okay, well, thanks everyone for uh, coming today to this session about running um, Kubernetes slash OpenShift. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep it, uh, you know, uh, compatible, so to speak, uh, on OpenStack bare metal. That is uh, ironic. Uh, my name is uh, Ramon Sedo. I'm the product manager for a few things. Uh, one of them is the integration between OpenShift and uh, OpenStack, and this is part of it. And well, let's start by talking about uh, bare metal itself. Um, we have been seeing in this OpenStack Summit and in the previous one and over probably the last two years that bare metal is, is on trend. Like um, four years ago, the number of sessions about Ironic were limited. If you check now, there are so many more. We are seeing the same in uh, the market, many customers, many partners. Uh, and you know you can see that uh, all over the place. Uh, Amazon uh, is providing uh, bare metal. Uh, why? Well, because customers require it. In the um, OpenStack user surveys, uh, the one from last year and the one in this year, we can see how users are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm running much more bare metal than I used to. To the point that last year, what we saw is that 20% of the production environments with OpenStack had ironic in them. That's, that's quite, you know, an increase from our previous years. This year, and this is something we want, I want to talk about today, um, there's another data that we suspected, right? Uh, which is, most of this is driven by uh, wanting to have Kubernetes containers on bare metal, right? This is one of the things that's driving this, uh, this growth. Um, hopefully we're gonna see uh, some of the reasons why uh, today. Um, I wanted to talk about this uh, blog post. This is uh, from uh, Joe Fernandez that's leading uh, at Red Hat the BU for cloud. And uh, well, it describes very well in a high level that anybody can understand uh, the reasons why bare metal is making a comeback, right? Um, a number of use cases, yeah. This year and pre the previous year, Kubernetes is one of the main use cases driving this adoption, right? Traditionally, we have seen many of them, though. Uh, HPC is a very popular one. Um, HPC traditionally has been running bare metal for many, many years. Um, when we started with OpenStack, we saw many HPC customers interested in adopting OpenStack, and in part also replacing um, what they were running on bare metal nodes by virtual machines, right, virtual instances. And, you know, the trend has been moving uh, a bit to have half and half or, you know, depending on uh, the use case, VMs and bare metal nodes, right? When you need direct access uh, to dedicated uh, devices, um, well, it's obvious, yeah. Uh, you can use with virtual machines things like PCI pass-through. Uh, for the network, you can have uh, SRIOV. Um, there are a few things you can do, but at times that's inconvenient and maybe you have full access if you can afford that. To the, to the metal, it's always uh, a little bit easier. Big data, uh, it's nothing new. Big data has been there for a long time. And um, we have seen many uh, customers also using bare metal in there. For example, you can have the control nodes in uh, VMs and then all the data nodes in uh, bare metal. That's, that's a common use case. But I would say that in, in the last two years, Kubernetes is the one that's uh, picking up and driving this increase, right? Okay, then let's, let's see why. And in particular today, uh, as you know, Kubernetes runs on OpenStack very happily. Uh, it's been doing that, uh, well, since almost the beginning for many reasons. The integrations are uh, great, but in particular in bare metal, which means um, OpenStack managing the nodes, the bare metal nodes that um, Kubernetes run on. So let's start by talking about Kubernetes. And Kubernetes slash OpenShift, right? Uh, I don't want to focus in either of them. Um, Kubernetes is workload driven. So meaning that if I'm a developer, do I really care what's in the underlying platform, whether it's OpenStack, whether it's bare metal, virtual machines, or even if it's public or private? As a developer, I don't really care. As a developer, what I need is to have access to my containers, to be able to uh, keep working on my applications. If I need to distribute them, I want to have ways to distribute them, 
And if you tell me that it's a physical load balancer or Octavia in OpenStack or HA proxy in some node that somebody set up, I'm happy with it as long as it works, right? So this is the premise. And what we want to do is an integration that's seamless, that provides us this type of experience to developers, right? Now I'm not a developer anymore, I'm the operator, so I need to have a platform that behaves in that way, that allows me to have this level of uh, integration in a transparent way for my, uh, my users, the developers, right? Well, um, Kubernetes and OpenStack are deeply integrated, uh, and this, this integration, as you probably have seen in some of the sessions here, is only growing. Um, say, for example, with storage, uh, we have Manila. Manila, in turn, uh, can use Ceph uh, via CephFS, right? Uh, we have, if we don't use uh, bare metal, we can use uh, Courier. Uh, Courier understands Neutron, and Courier understands uh, CNI. So we have a level of integration in many of the areas where uh, we need this. And again, it's great when I'm the operator to be able to do all of this, but all of this needs to be transparent, needs to be hidden for the uh, end user of Kubernetes, which, is, which are the developers, right? And then OpenStack itself, uh, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows that, it's, it goes across all the platform in my data center, right? It's an abstraction layer where, uh, again, in the same way that developers need this uh, level of uh, transparency, you know, um, the operators also want the same when it comes to the data center. OpenStack abstracts the data center and makes the data center as a infrastructure as a service, you know. Um, so these are reasons why uh, it's a good choice uh, to run Kubernetes on OpenStack. Today we're gonna see in particular um, bare metal. As you know, the bare metal service that we have in OpenStack is ironic. And I want to cover a few things about ironic. Um, first off, when we need to manage bare metal in general, we need a platform that allows us to do uh, the life cycle, right? Uh, we probably have experience with OpenStack if we are considering running uh, Ironic, and we want to have uh, you know, similar experience, if not identical, to the one we have with virtual machines. This is where uh, Ironic comes into place, right? Ironic uses, um, Ironic has its own APIs, but you can manage Ironic through Nova, which is exactly what you do with the virtual machines, and when you do OpenStack uh, server start, that server can be either a virtual machine or a bare metal node, okay? Uh, and then today we're gonna cover a few of the things listed in here, like rooted spine and leaf, multi-tenancy, auto discovery, super cool things that we've been adding to Ironic uh, over, over the years, some of them this year. Um, and then again, for this level of, uh, say, compatibility with the experience, right? Uh, when you need images uh, for Ironic, well, uh, you are used to upload your image uh, in QCow and then deploy from it. Well, you can do all the same with Ironic, right? Uh, there are different ways of doing that. I don't know, you can have an image of a whole disk or an image of a partition, right? And play with that depending on your needs. But all of this is available for you. Um, another important thing is, uh, well, how does Ironic integrate in my architecture when I want to do this? Well, uh, first off, we, we want to keep things simple as much as possible, right? Uh, here you can see a typical architecture in which we have uh, a mix of compute nodes where the virtual machines run and bare metal nodes that are owned by this controller node where Ironic is running, right? Um, if you see in this architecture, uh, this is pretty standard. Eh? You can make it more complex or more simple. Yeah, probably. You can have just one node with Ironic owning uh, everything. But in here you can see how there's another cloud, right? Uh, this is triple O, deploying everything, right? And then you have Ironic in your controller, managing through the BMC the bare metal node, which is the, sec the, the, the second from uh, the bottom. And all of this uh, to provide to your tenants a platform where they can mix VMs and bare metal nodes, okay? All of this is documented. We don't need to expand on any of this. And uh, if you wanna try it, this is probably the simplest form of uh, deploying and managing Ironic architecture-wise. 
Uh, now everything is installed, everything works, the node speaks boot happily, and uh, I, I'm ready as an operator to offer this service to my uh, tenants. Uh, and what do I need to do? Well, again, the, the, the workflow should be simple enough, right? Uh, basically, I go ahead and create networks, the networks that I have pre-configured probably my switches, where the nodes, the bare metal nodes managed by Ironic are connected to. I create flavors. This is if you use um, Nova, which is, you know, the most cases uh, you are going to be using Nova with Ironic. So you create a flavor. That flavor will be associated with bare metal. And you upload optionally images for your tenants, but your tenants can also go and upload their own images. And then you register the bare metal nodes. This is something that the infrastructure owner needs to do, right? Uh, usually it'll be the, the admin of the, of the platform. So you have a new rack of servers or a few racks of servers. You want them to be owned by Ironic. So you go through the registration process and pretty much you are done, right? And then I'm now the tenant. I want to consume this uh, service that uh, my operator is providing me. Well, to me, it should be an easy workflow as well. Right? I just pick the network that I, that I want, or maybe I've been given just one. Um, I choose the operating system, that is the image that's in there. Maybe I have my own image. The flavor that I want, that flavor will be, in a mixed environment, one associated to bare metal nodes. And I start the VM instance, and I'm ready to operate in the same way that I would with a virtual machine. Right? So far, so good. Okay. So, yeah, this is just to show that things, uh, once they are running and we uh, manage to keep them simple, you know, should just work. Then, um, let's review a few features that Ironic has that uh, make it, you know, a really compelling solution for anything that needs to run on bare metal, but especially for Kubernetes uh, as well, right? Um, one that we are, uh, that we have, um, released, I think it was in Newton, one of the first integrations where we completed uh, the integration with Neutron, and uh, basically that allowed us to have um, an untrusted tenant environment with multi-tenants. What does that mean? Well, I want my tenants using bare metal nodes to be isolated between them, right? That's uh, multi-tenancy provided by Ironic and Neutron, thanks to an ML2 driver capable of talking to the switches, as it's shown in here, right? So basically, uh, I need to do a very simple operation in the switch when I want to isolate the tenant. See, if tenant A has VLAN 100 and tenant B has VLAN 200, and they are going to use or and reuse the same uh, bare metal nodes, well, uh, if I don't trust, or, or, or if it's an untrusted tenant environment, I don't want tenant A and tenant B to have access to each other's networks, I can do it with, uh, with this. I just need a driver, an ML2 driver, capable of setting the switch ports in this way. Um, something else that I can do, uh, thanks to this integration, is to configure, uh, well, bonding, right? Uh, link aggregation. How do we do this? Well, in a similar way, right? Sometimes a user will want to use uh, one NIC, and maybe the next time that user or a different tenant will want to set up a bond. Well, with this, you can do it, right? Basically, um, uh, at the OS level, you will configure Cloud Init, you will tell Cloud Init, hey, use these two uh, NICs and configure bonding in this mode, right? And then the ML2 driver will go to the switch at uh, deployment time, and it will know that you want to create these uh, two ports, which translate into, ironic, uh, into neutron ports. And then you will have everything you need on the software level and on the uh, physical level, right? Usually you will have two switches. Uh, the node will be connected um, physically to the two switches, the usual. I'm sure most of us are familiar with uh, this type of setup. Um, something else that uh, is implemented is uh, support for setting um, ACLs, uh, basically to be able to use um, security groups, right? Um, I have to say that this is still um, uh, a little bit early in the implementation. That's because of the drivers. Not all of them do this uh, in, in the way that um, we would consider production ready, but we are working on it. And 
here you have some documentation if you want to uh, take a look in detail at uh, how to do this. This is all part of the standard documentation, right, uh, for, for Queens, uh, for Rocky, and soon for Stein. And in particular, I wanted to talk today about uh, one ML2 driver that we are releasing uh, with Rocky, right? And that is an ML2 driver based on Ansible networking. And this is super cool because one of the things we, uh, we have been seeing so far since this integration between uh, Neutron and Ironic was that, okay, uh, driver A will work with this uh, set of switches, right? And driver B will work with this set of switches. So vendors uh, will create drivers for their uh, switches. But then we thought, look, there is uh, Ansible networking, and Ansible networking is capable of talking to multiple switch families, right? You can talk to Juno S, but you can talk to, um, I don't know, Cisco Nexus switches as well, right? So why not leverage that and implement an ML2 driver capable of doing this? And this is what we came up with, and uh, it was amazing because we uh, were able to complete that in one cycle during Rocky. And um, at Red Hat, we are going to start supporting this with OSP 14, which is the Rocky release. Let's real quick uh, review the workflow in here. So basically, you boot your VM, your, your bare metal node on a tenant network, and then at deployment time, since remember, this is mostly for non-trusted tenant environments, so at deployment time, you configure physically in the switch the provisioning uh, network, meaning that you go, well, the ML2 driver goes to the switch port and says, now set up only the VLAN used for provisioning. No tenant has access to that VLAN, right? When the provisioning is done, uh, you do the same, the ML2 driver does the same and goes and changes the configuration of the switch port to the VLAN associated to that tenant, to the VLAN that that tenant picked to deploy its uh, bare metal node, okay? And as simple as that, I mean, the, the concept is uh, really simple and I would say if not half of it, a big portion of it was already implemented in Ansible. And, you know, in our tests, this is working pretty well and uh, I guess this next year we are gonna see it, you know, expanding with many uh, users because uh, there's a lot of interest and, and a lot of demand and this is why um, we really went ahead and implemented it. Okay, you have this blog post uh, by uh, Dan Rathers uh, describing this in, in the RDO uh, project blog. Um, okay, something else that we've been learning from customers, and this is not new, this, is, this comes from at least four years uh, that I can remember. Um, actually, I see here some of the users that uh, initially were asking for this, and this is the spine and leaf topology that's very popular among um, network architects, right? We had to implement uh, support for spine and leaf in, uh, well, in OpenStack, that means in Ironic, because uh, this is when you start dealing with the uh, physical nodes. And this basically, uh, what it does, I I'm going to simplify a lot, because it, it, this talk is about uh, Kubernetes on bare metal. But basically what you can do with that is, uh, I can have multiple leaves, right? Each of which has its own L2 domain, and they are connected to each other through L3. Right, usually on the top of the rack switch. And then you have your spine switches that connect everything with everything, right? If you are a network architect, I'm sure for you this is like your day to day, very simple. If not, we want to make it simple. But then, if we think about the way OpenStack works with Ironic, well, we need to be able to pick boot. So we need to be able to pass uh, this um, L2 to L3, go with my DHCP request, uh, all the way to the leaf where the DHCP server is and come back, right? And uh, when you go through a uh, top of the rack switch, well, your source MAC um, won't be your source MAC anymore as in the source MAC for the host, but it'll be the one from the switch. Okay, so this has been solved for a very long time with DHCP relay, only that we had to implement uh, this in, in Neutron. We finished that implementation a few releases ago. I can't remember. I think it was um, Queens, definitely, 
Um, and well, now it's ready for you to use. So, and this again, think about this. Um, this is part of this abstraction layer that OpenStack offers to us that we want to hide to our end users, right? This is efficiency for the network. This is how network architects say uh, things should work. We are capable of doing this with Ironic, and this is yet another reason why Ironic is a great platform for abstracting the uh, complexity uh, to, the, to the end user. More things, auto discovery, another great um, functionality that we have in Ironic. If you have a small number of servers, okay, maybe it's not a problem to go ahead and write uh, what you need to do to register each note individually, right, to, to Ironic. Basically, to register a note, you need to tell Ironic how to manage that note. And you do this through the BMC, that is IPMI, iDrag, ILO, IRMC, etc. right? Uh, but if you have a lot of racks of servers and uh, you have maybe a weekend to do all of these because, you know, uh, your customer was very successful, they grew too fast, and now you're under pressure to have all of this set up over a weekend. Well, you can do that. Just rack them up, uh, make sure they are connected to the provisioning network, and uh, have them um, pixie booting, right? And the next is uh, the note is registered uh, in Ironic. And then you can do things, magic things, this is really cool, like, uh, and there is an example here that I wanted to show where basically you say, in this example, if you are the note, um, set these credentials, right? For example, I don't know, root Calvin as the login and password, and uh, take from the inspection, because this is another thing that Ironic does. Ironic inspects the notes through Ironic Inspector, extracts a lot of the specs and information that you can use to do things like this. To do things like saying, if it's a Dell Note, configure iDrag, and uh, the VMC address, configure it as the uh, drag address for the driver. And that's all automatic, so you don't have to do any of this. And all of a sudden, of this, and all of a sudden, you have, you know, uh, maybe uh, dozens, if not hundreds of nodes registered for you. Okay, um, more things uh, about Ironic. And something that we have uh, seen is a lot of interest in Redfish. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with IPMI, right? Uh, IPMI, well, it's a tool to manage remotely nodes and, and uh, to power manage and, you know, change boot order, uh, things like this in uh, general, right? Uh, well, Redfish is a similar concept, only that it's API driven. Uh, it tries to do much more than uh, some uh, power management. And more importantly, it's becoming a standard, a standard adopted by many of the vendors, if, if not all, right? And most new uh, servers come with support for Redfish. That indeed makes our life so much easier, right? If we can rely on a standardized way of power management, uh, because this is pretty much what Ironic will do to power manage our servers, then things are gonna get so much easier and then also um, implementing new features uh, around this management will become faster and also easier. And for example, some of the things that we are doing for um, Stain is uh, adding to Redfish things like out of van inspection, right? Uh, like you don't have to boot a node and you know put an image in the memory, extract everything and then report back to the central um, controllers. You know, you can do that out of band. That's great, and Redfish uh, should allow us to do this. So we're working on that. Or uh, something really cool as well, and, and this goes along with um, Edge Your Cases, which is um, boot from virtual media without Pixie, without DHCP, right? We all have been at an ILO or an iDrag and mapping an ISO locally and then booting from that through the network, et cetera. Well, what, is, what if we have all this logic in uh, the driver, right? And it allows us to boot without EHCP. Sometimes we cannot do the EHCP relay, right? Sometimes our um, network architects will say, no, 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 I'm not gonna allow you to do this because, you know, I have some policies that uh, don't permit me uh, allowing this. Okay, 
So that would sort this out for us. Uh, edge use cases also um, fall into this. Into this. Bias configuration, if you were here yesterday on the keynote, um, this was shown as a part of the uh, new things that we are doing with Ironic. This is super cool as well. Uh, in this example, you can see how we can uh, go to compatible uh, drivers, right? This logic is implemented in the drivers, but uh, basically what you say is, hey, disable for me hyper-threading and enable uh, the VT flag in my CPU. Every driver will tell you what you can do, right? To just uh, set it up and um, becoming a little bit more technical uh, at the cleaning stage. The cleaning means uh, when you are using Ironic, there is a way to say, please uh, empty the disks, either the metadata or just, you know, uh, zero everything in the disk. And there are a number of steps in there, right? So you basically plug this into the steps. And if your driver allows it, you will be able to interact with the BIOS settings. You can actually ask the driver, hey, what settings in my BIOS can I, can I modify, right? And it will tell you, and then you can play with this, all right? Um, and multi-site. Multi um, this is, okay, multi-site depends on a number of um, features. Um, some of them we have finished. Uh, if you take a look at the ironic conductor and node group affinity. This is one of the requirements so that you have a central uh, site with your main controllers, hopefully highly available, right? Maybe you are doing ironic and more things, right? With this uh, central control plane. But then you have maybe remote sites. And in these remote sites, you have nodes that also need to be managed by ironic, right? Okay, so with this, what you can do is uh, obviously, well, not obviously maybe, but uh, you are not going to control IPMI or Redfish or iDrag from the central site to a remote site. That would mean exposing IPMI or whichever uh, BMC um, you want to, to use uh, through the network, right? Sometimes maybe through the internet or dark fiber or whichever it is that you use to connect your sites. But you can have an instance of Ironic doing that for you. And that instance of Ironic can be associated to uh, these uh, nodes. Well, in this example, I wanted to show you what we are doing so that we can achieve a cleaner uh, way of doing multi-site with uh, Ironic. And this is also part of you know, the edge uh, use cases that uh, we see that many users are, are wanting, right? Okay. Well, uh, more things. Uh, Kubernetes on OpenStack and what we are doing in here. This is pretty simple. This, I'm sure, is no surprise to anybody. Uh, how you do this? Well, you install uh, OpenStack. You have OpenStack up and running. Then uh, you provision your operating system, say RHEL, CentOS, whichever you choose. And then you have your Kubernetes installer. You point Kubernetes to these nodes and you install them. What you are doing with this? Well, uh, you are managing your bare metal nodes that are used for Kubernetes from Ironic, right? And the life cycle, everything is managed from Ironic, and Kubernetes is happily running in it. This is the simplest way uh, to do this. And if you go to the documentation uh, to how to do this, and here I'm talking about uh, an installer in particular, the OpenShift installer where, well, you need to do this. Provision the nodes. We all know how to do this. Uh, add the DNS entries. This is more uh, specific to OpenShift, right? OpenShift works with uh, DNS uh, names internally and externally. Uh, so you do this with your DNS service. You distribute the SSH keys, and after that, you are ready to install. Uh, there is an installer, uh, really cool, OpenShift uh, Ansible. You point OpenShift Ansible to these nodes and have it installed. Um, it's, it's, it's simpler than uh, it sounds, right? And it's all documented. But we wanted to make it even simpler. And we said, what if, you know, I need to first test this, see if I like it, I don't have so many resources, maybe I don't have so much time. Uh, what if I could install just one node and have this node deploy in OpenShift for me? In the same way, right? But without having to go through the whole process of installing 
open um, stack first uh, in a highly available mode, et cetera. Well, uh, what we did in Triple O in this release is integrating this logic, the OpenShift Ansible bits, in the Triple O code. So now you can tell to Triple O, hey, install um, an OpenShift cluster for me, please. And Triple O will do everything for you. It will install the operating system. After it installs the operating system, it will install OpenShift in it. And by the time it finishes, you have OpenShift running on bare metal, managed, this bare metal, by OpenStack, and assisting the installation of OpenShift itself, right? Um, let's see how this looks like, more or less. Installing Triple uh, O is really simple, right? So you need a node, CentOS, RHEL, and you install the package that provides Triple uh, O, and then you do uh, a configuration in a file called undercloud.conf, and then you say, um, OpenStack, under cloud, install. You go to have a coffee or you go for lunch, come back, and everything should be uh, ready for you to start provisioning nodes, right? Auto-discovering nodes, maybe uh, you wanted to use the spine and leaf use case, et cetera, right? Uh, all of this, remember, all of this is ironic. Triple O uses ironic. So whenever you're using Triple O, slash director, director is the downstream name of Triple uh, O, you are using ironic. Right? You're using Ironic, you're using Nova, and uh, you're using Glance, so everything that you know. It's like an all-in-one OpenStack with the minimum things it needs to deploy. OpenStack on the one hand, this is how Triple O started, and in this case, OpenShift on the other hand, or Ceph clusters, right? So um, this is an example of uh, how you interact with this. Obviously, in uh, OpenShift, you have different roles, as you do in OpenStack. There's a role for the master nodes, where you have the APIs, then there's the infra nodes, uh, then you have the, um, the, the worker nodes, right? Those would be the, the compute nodes, compute as in uh, hosting the apps uh, with containers. You tell, in this case, to Triple O, uh, hey, install for me three masters, three workers, and three infras. Oh, okay, cool, I'll do that. And on top of this, you can also say, hey, and I will need storage. We're gonna talk about storage in a minute. So in the notes, uh, make a converged uh, type of deployment because, you know, I want to just get up to speed real fast and use one disk to set up a cluster FS cluster, right? So you can tell all of this to Triple O and just have it deployed the, the way. If you have ever done this, uh, you will be familiar with the uh, bottom half of this screen where you say, a deploy an over cloud and call it in this case OpenShift. If you're interested in the code, uh, go there, have a look at the code. Um, we are working on the documentation for this, some of it already, uh, but uh, soon we will have uh, more, much more and much nicer, right? Now, storage. Let me see how much time do I have. Yeah, hopefully we're gonna make it. Um, a few options here, remember, this is Kubernetes, on bare metal, right? Um, when we run Kubernetes on virtual machines, yeah, we are used to present uh, storage to the containers, to the pods, um, by persistent volumes, right? If you have ever done that, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, this is the equivalent to what you do with Cinda, right? With Cinda, you present a block device. Well, with containers, you have a similar concept. You present that block device, to your containers, and then they use it for persistence or even for ephemera, if, depending on how you orchestrate it. Okay, so looking at the options that we have for storage, I wanted to highlight those that can be candidates for running OpenShift slash Kubernetes on bare metal. One is GlasterFS. GlasterFS is probably um, one of the simplest uh, solutions in this combination. Yeah, host path, but host path is literally uh, within the host, right, per node. So it's probably not so ready for uh, production or for many of the use cases that uh, our customers are telling that they have. Um, with OpenStack itself, you have Manila. Here, I pointed Manila to NFS. Well, when you create a Manila share, what you get is an NFS URL, right? Um, nothing prevents you from using that on bare metal. That's super simple and it's a very 
cool integration because of the transparency that it gives. Um, this morning, this morning or earlier today, there was a talk from the CERN about uh, the uh, Manila advances that we are making with uh, Ceph, with CephFS, and, and, and this is super cool. So this is another option that we can have, and local, it's another option. Okay, let's review. Ah, and before I forget, when, when I ask this to customers on what they need, they say, well, I would like to have a single storage backend. I, I don't mind which one, right, as long as it works, obviously. But having to deal with um, IELTS of um, storage backends, you know, if I can avoid it, I, I will try. Okay, if you are using OpenStack, most likely this is going to be uh, Ceph, or maybe you have your own storage array, right, uh, NetApp, EMC, whatnot, and then you can uh, consume it transparently through Sinner or uh, through Manila, if your backend supports uh, Manila as well. Okay, and something else that they are uh, telling us is, look, um, some of the apps that I have containerized uh, want to use read, write, many access modes. That means that I want to have one persistent volume that's accessed by a number of uh, containers at the same time, right? Then you go, okay, that reduces a little bit the options that I have. I end up with ClusterFS and uh, NFS. Okay, so let's see how this integrate. Well, when I deploy with triple O, or manually, right, it doesn't matter, uh, it will work in the same way, I can create uh, what we call converged um, cluster FS, um, cluster of uh, cluster FS on the same nodes where I run the pods. Actually, cluster FS in this case is containerized, so it runs as any other container, as any other pod. Um, in the infra nodes, maybe you are going to do that to host your registry, the registry with the images for your containers, and on the worker nodes, you can have another ClusterFS cluster, and that will be for your persistent volumes, right, when your users start creating them, and you can consume it directly from there. So with Triple you can get up to speed super fast with this. Now, what people that have a lot of experience with this tell us is, well, I would rather have the ClusterFS separate and uh, for performance reasons on the one hand, and maybe I'm using this ClusterFS for something else and I may be putting load from other uh, services, right, besides uh, Kubernetes. Well, you're free to choose your topology here, but to get you started, you can do this. Uh, so this is one of the options that we have. Another option when we are running Kubernetes on OpenStack, or rather on bare metal managed by OpenStack, is Manila, right? In this case, I have um, the nodes managed by OpenStack on the top, in blue, where Kubernetes is uh, running, and then I have OpenStack with Ironic and Manila, at least, and probably the rest of the services running in there, right? And usually I will have a Ceph storage cluster, and the Ceph storage cluster will, consume, will be consumed by uh, Glance, by Manila, by Cinda, so we are solving the uh, request, the requirement for a single storage backend. This is a pretty neat solution, uh, it's clean, it's easy to understand, and it's something we probably are already familiar with, right? OpenStack backed by Ceph, and we're putting on top, um, not on top maybe in this case because they are bare metal nodes, but um, ironic managing bare metal nodes, okay? Right, and I'm gonna finish with this. Um, two minutes to go through the network. This should be real, really simple. If you've been, uh, if you have any experience with ironic, half of this is boilerplate almost, is what you know. Ironic in the OpenStack cluster will be managing your nodes. How? Well, interacting with the BMC, right? It will do uh, what Ironic does. Power on, power off, power cycle, change boot order now, uh, etc. And for that, you will have uh, to have access to the BMCs. So you will need that network on the one hand. Then you will need a provisioning network as well. You want to be able to put the images, uh, whichever those are, on the bare metal nodes. Uh, for the master nodes, for the infra nodes, for the worker nodes. Okay, nothing new here. And then, usually, 
you will want a dedicated data network. It's not mandatory. You can reuse the provisioning network if you want. But, you know, it's a good practice to separate them because maybe the data network is going to have um, more bandwidth. Maybe what you are going to be doing in there is uh, a bond with two, two NICs, right, for both bandwidth and high availability. So you will do that. And at the same time, and again, if you start doing this, uh, it will become obvious, you will need access to a public network because you will want to expose your container applications to the world, right? So you will do that. Probably you won't need to do much research for that. Then Kubernetes itself, uh, just like uh, OpenStack with the virtual machines, can use OpenVSwitch as the um, CNI, the container uh, network interface that comes with uh, Kubernetes as a CNI plugin. And, well, we all know uh, that one of the things that we can do with um, OpenVSwitch, and this is what Kubernetes does, is create a VXLAN tunnel for the pod-to-pod -pod and node-to-node -node communication. So one pod having containers in one node and another one with uh, containers in another node, well, will travel through the VXLAN tunnel. So this is pretty much how it works. And with that, uh, I'd like to finish this presentation. I'm not sure if we have much time for questions, but uh, if anybody has questions, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. May you want to use the microphone? I wonder if you can connect those containers instead of uh, being talking uh, through VXLAN, through uh, physical bare metal uh, network. Yeah, so uh, usually the way it works with Kubernetes is you will have a CNI plugin, and this is one example. So you will need a CNI plugin that uh, suits this uh, use case. For, for, for the bare metal network? Uh, the bare metal nodes themselves are connected to the data network, yes. right? So this is uh, abstracted. The containers have no clue about that. Container to container, uh, use this abstraction over, uh, or this overlay, this network overlay to talk between them. So they are not exposed. Uh, yeah, not but if I want for them to be exposed, I can with the CNI, with my custom CNI? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you didn't mention about issues of... Uh, Authentication and authorization. How do you handle identities in OpenStack or Keystone and identities in key okay. Kubernetes? Yeah. So uh, OpenShift itself will have its own authentication, right? In these examples with bare metal, we don't necessarily integrate authentication between the two, even though it's an option. When you run OpenShift and OpenStack, these are some of the things that uh, you could do. Okay. You could configure it to, you know, uh, manage authentication through Keystone. Okay, so can just mention that what we did recently was to provide a way to integrate authentication using application credentials. So okay. you can get application credentials from OpenStack and use those on Kubernetes to be recognized as user in Kubernetes. Yeah, uh, uh, this is not that something that in this okay. environment uh, we've tried a lot because, you know, it's kind of separate. Okay, I understand. But it's, it's a possibility, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right, well, thanks everybody for your attention.